Good morning. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our annual science symposium, which takes place virtually this year. It's particularly fitting then that we'll be exploring artificial intelligence, the broad range of technologies that underpins much of our modern world, including Zoom and popular features like virtual backgrounds. The term artificial intelligence or AI originated in academic research during the 1950s. It's now increasingly a common part of our lexicon, often dropped into articles or conversation with little explanation. But what is artificial intelligence exactly? It turns out the answer isn't so simple. To consider fully the promise and potential harms of AI, we must first understand what the term means and the what the technology encompasses. Our first session today will take up that task. Our second session will turn to applications from Zoom backgrounds to Siri and Alexa. AI based technologies are already a part of everyday life. Things like internet search engines and adaptive cruise control in cars also draw on AI. But applications of this technology also extend to the arts, education, policing, science, and medicine. And this just scratches the surface of current and future uses, as our distinguished panelists will discuss. Then, after a lunch break, we'll focus our attention on the interface between humans and AI. Each of these topics intersects with important policy and ethical questions, which our final session of the day will consider. AI bears on privacy and fairness, and its applications can collide with and exacerbate existing biases and systemic inequities. We must consider how to mitigate bias in AI, and more broadly, how to ensure that the evolution of the technology engages the full diversity of human experiences. And as we consider these questions, how do we reach consensus on ethical standards for new technologies? How do we develop regulations and policies in a new field with little legal precedent? AI holds great promise, yet also raises serious concerns in realms far beyond engineering and computer science. There is a growing recognition that diverse perspectives drawn from across traditional lines of discipline, profession, and lived experience must be brought to bear on AI. This is our aim in keeping with the Institute's commitment to interdisciplinary exploration. Before we begin, I'd like to offer some thanks. First, I'm grateful to our current science program faculty co-directors, Professor Ido Berger and Professor Immaculata De Vivo for planning this convening. These efforts began last spring, so I'd also like to recognize our former science co-director, Professor Alyssa Goodman for her contributions to this program. Thank you as well to Institute staff members for all your hard work, especially the academic ventures and engagement team led by Becky Wasserman and the events team led by Jessica Thicklin. And of course, I want to acknowledge the distinguished group of panelists and moderators joining us today. Thanks to you all. Finally, I'd like to thank the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors who enable the Institute's work and ensure it is free and open to the public. I also gratefully acknowledge the Artists Butler James Fund for Science, the Melanie Mason and David Nemec Fund for Science, and the Melanie Mason Nemec 71 Current Use Fund for Science, which support this event. And now I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Professor Ido Berger, who will be moderating our first session. Ido is Professor of Astronomy in the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences, in addition to co-directing the Institute Science Program. And he was the Mildred Lunda Weissman Fellow here at Radcliffe in 2019. Welcome, Ido. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Brown Nagin, and good morning. Um, over the next few hours, we will hear from a wide range of distinguished speakers about artificial intelligence or AI. Whether we recognize it or not, AI is now an integral part of our daily lives. We interact with it through our smart devices, social media, and even while driving on the road. We are impacted by the use of AI in science, medicine, manufacturing, and the service industry. 
AI is deployed at our local grocery store and in faraway war zones. It is being used to communicate with people as well as to track our faces and study our emotions. At the same time, the basic um, science and the technology development of AI keeps evolving rapidly in ingenious ways that can raise both hopes and concerns for the future. And the growth in sophistication and deployment of AI is also forcing us to ask questions about what it means to be human, to have intelligence, to be creative, and to be ethical. In today's symposium, we will explore this broad arena by looking at various critical aspects of artificial intelligence, what it is and isn't, about the myriad ways in which it is transforming fields as wide ranging as science, medicine, and the arts, about the interaction of AI and robots with people in our current daily lives and into the future, and about the many critical and oftentimes vexing issues relating to the ethics, regulations, and laws governing AI and our interaction with it. The symposium is organized in four sessions around these topics, what is AI, applications of AI, AI and people, and AI ethics and policies. Each session will include presentations by one to three speakers, followed by a moderated conversations and an audience question period. I will introduce the speakers and moderators at the beginning of each session. I encourage you to attend as many of the sessions as you can, since each one is guaranteed to raise and tackle a complex and interrelated set of issues and questions about the multifaceted nature of artificial intelligence. So now, without further ado, we will commence with session one titled, What is AI? And to help us address this question, our speaker today is Professor Fernando Villegas, Principal Scientist at Google, Sally Starling Siever, Professor at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and um, Gordon McKay, Professor of Computer Science at the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Following the presentation, I will have the chance to engage in conversation with Fernanda and to moderate the audience Q&A discussion. Please remember that you can submit your concise questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It is now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Fernanda Villegas. Thank you so much, Professor Berger. Um, let me just make sure I can share my screen so we can get started. So what is AI? Um, huge question, and I only have 20 minutes to talk about that. So what I, what I hope to do today is to just give you some nuggets into how the technology works, what are some of the implications of how the technology works, and, and really some nuggets that you can hopefully take with you for the rest of the day um, as more of the discussions happen. And so I'm also, um, I have to say, kind of a biased speaker in the sense that I'm going to talk about what is AI in terms of a human-centered view, which I think is incredibly important. And so let's start with a very simple um, example, one that anyone who has email probably uses uh, in the background. Whether or not you know it, you're using AI. Um, if you're doing any spam filtering, chances are you you're have an AI engine uh, running in the background. So what do we mean when we say AI, machine learning? What is that? What is that technology? A very simple way of thinking about that is in contrast to the kinds of computational technologies that went that came before. And so, for instance, if I were to build a spam filter before machine learning, I would have to write down all the rules for that spam filter. I would have to say, you know, if the incoming email um, contains a string credit card, then mark that incoming email as spam. And I would have to have one of those rules for every different kind of uh, trigger word or rule um, about spam. So you can imagine how long that list would be and also how brittle that, um, that approach is because it's a never ending task, right? In contrast to this rule based programming, what machine learning does is I don't give the computer the rules. What I give the computer is a, a, a large data set. And so I'm going to give a, a pile of emails, if you will, that have been labeled by people as either spam or not spam. And so I'm constantly, I'm training my model to look at a number of messages. And I say, okay, this one is a legitimate message. Uh, this one here is spam. This other one is legitimate. And so over time, 
the system ingests all of that information and starts to create patterns, statistical patterns of what kind of looks like, you know, uh, a spam message and what may be legitimate mess messages. So this is the big deal about machine learning is that I don't have to sit there and program all the explicit rules. In fact, I don't program explicit rules. I only program the goal. It's called an objective function. I say you're trying to different, you're trying to categorize spam and not spam in this case. And so the system creates its own sets of rules, okay, to understand that space. Um, and this is really great because what it does is that it, it unlocks the possibility of us trying to solve problems for which we don't know the rules. So for instance, how can I do better diagnosing of cancer? How can I predict earthquakes? How can I predict floods? I do not know the rules for those things, uh, but maybe I can train these machines to try to understand some of, some of the rules or some of the patterns that, that govern these complex um, questions, okay? I will also posit kind of a provocative view here, which is I think the fact that these systems have no explicit rules, I think it is both their superpower, but also their, their super problem. It's both their highest strength and their biggest weakness, as we will see in some of the examples I'm, I'm about to give. Okay, so Another thing to keep in mind as we start to inhabit this world of AI systems is that we're gonna be living in the world um, of predictions and probabilities. So when I say that a, a machine learning system looks at a picture like this and decides it's a panda, what it's really doing, it's not deciding it's a panda, it's just giving me a list of probabilities of which Panda is the highest probability. But isn't it interesting, if you can look at this slide and you can see the panda and you can see the probabilities, you will notice that the system only thinks there is a 58.5% chance that this image is a panda, um, is of a panda. In fact, it also thinks that there is a 24.7% chance that this is a picture of a cat. Who would have thought? Right? And this is always the case. So whenever we're talking about a world of probabilities, there is no real full certainty. There is only the best guess. And that is incredibly important. Um, this is the same with, you know, healthcare um, situations where you want to do clinical assistive um, care. And so you may have a machine learning system looking at pathology slides like this one and saying, what is the probability that there is cancer? And if so, what grade of cancer are we talking about? Um, or what is the probability of the next word here that I'm going to type? If I say, if I already typed, I love you, what is the next word? This is again, something that um, um, researchers and engineers have trained machine learning systems to do, to guess the next word, the next token. OK, or um, to look at user generated comments online and to try to understand what is the probability that this is a toxic comment. OK, so there's a number of, of uh, applications and you will be hearing more about those applications as the day progresses today. And, you know, you, one of the things to keep in mind is that these applications range from the seemingly very straightforward kind of like, what is this a picture of, to much, much more complex um, applications. So the next slide is a set of very different kinds of predictions. So should this person be hired? Should this student be admitted? Is this person likely to reoffend? Should this applicant get a loan? And so forth. And here, you have to be very careful. There are many questions here. There are questions about what kind of data have you trained these systems on? And if it is historical data, is it really what you want to use the historical data to move forward? Um, and is algorithmic decision making or assistive decision making even what you want to do? in some of these high stakes scenarios. So I'll just leave you with that question for now. We'll come back to that in a moment. 
Um, and now I want to turn to two real world examples to help ground some of these concepts that I just talked about. And the first one is going to come from the healthcare world. So this is a system that was developed, developed at Google in collaboration with hospitals and doctors um, to look at diabetic retinopathy, for short, DR. Um, this is the fastest growing cause of preventable blindness around the world. If it's caught early, it's not a problem. You can treat it, you're good. If it's caught late, people can go blind and they do. And so, and one of the other problems around uh, this kind of, of illness is the fact that you, you have a shortage of doctors in many parts of the world. So this, uh, for example, is an image from India where there is a sort shortage of over a hundred thousand doctors and 45% of patients um, tend to suffer vision loss before they get diagnosis. So if we could do some assistive care, uh, we would definitely, def especially for a preventable illness, uh, it would be a, probably a good idea to do that. So um, the, the team went back and looked at lots and lots. How do you, how do you even diagnose this uh, illness? You look at images of the back of your eye, images like these that I'm showing you here. These are called retinal fundus images. And then this is how doctors try to diagnose whether or not uh, you should be seen by, by a specialist, whether or not you have a healthy uh, system, it's, it's good, it's all good. So once the system was trained on these retinal fundus images, it became actually really good. The system is, has very high accuracy um, in predicting uh, DR and what level of DR. Now, one of the things I wanna call attention to also here is the fact that um, the information you see at the bottom is actually AI explainability. So here, not only is the system trying to predict and giving the doctors or the nurses the best guess, the system is also trying to highlight for them, why does it think that this person is healthy? Or why does it think that this person needs to be needs to have a uh, be seen by a specialist, okay? And this is extremely important. It's extremely important because it goes to the, to the core of a question around trust. So in any high stake situations, professionals should not trust blindly any technology system that is given to them. And so being able to understand what is the system paying attention to, and not only that, being able to understand in medical terms what the system is looking at is incredibly important. Um, this system just very quickly was uh, um, um, it was already uh, used in in different countries. So India deployed in India and Thailand. Um, the accuracy, as I said, is very high, um, and the performance is is great so far. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about is not even so. This is the main point of this project is to diagnose diabetic retinopathy. And it did well, it's, it's good. Okay, but I wanna talk about the side effect of this project, uh, which was there was a new kind of prediction that these machines could do that wasn't possible before. Um, it turns out that these machines could predict the risk of cardiovascular factors just by look at, looking at these retinal fundus images. And this is something that ophthalmologists had never done. They were able, the, the systems were able to tell, to predict age, sex, smoking status, uh, and a number of other, of, of other factors. And so that was super interesting. It was something that doctors looking at the same images couldn't do. That called for a whole new round of explainability because all of a sudden doctors were asking themselves, how, how is the system doing this? What is it seeing that we're not seeing? And so after a couple of years, doctors working with engineers together were able to, to do a, a, a series of, of interpretability and explainability techniques to actually start to understand how is the system telling apart sex, for instance. Um, so very important to be able to have some level of transparency and explainability that makes sense to domain experts, because taking a step back, one of the reasons why 
everybody tends to talk about AI interpretability and explainability is because you want to make sure that these machines are not doing anything incorrectly or are not causing harm. And that absolutely is one of the main reasons we want explainability. But I think another reason that gets lost is the fact that we can learn. We can learn from these machines. We can learn how to be better doctors, better scientists, um, and, and, and so forth. So the other system I want to talk about is actually a very different kind of system, is a uh, large language system. And for this, um, I want to take you to a, to a web page. This is a public web page. You can all play with it afterwards that visualizes a system called BERT. And so this is a system that was trained on all of the English Wikipedia and plus the brown um, corpus, which is a corpus of books. It read all of those things. And basically what it was trained to do, it was taking sentences and um, the engineers would take out random words in the sentence and it would have to predict what that word was. Okay, and so this is what we're visualizing here. The sentence in this case, for instance, is to be or not to be, that is the blank. And it's telling me that the top completion is question. And next to each one of these potential completions, you see the percentage, right? The confidence. So it's like 56.9% confident that question is the top uh, um, completion for this, but there is difference, answer, and so forth. Um, I can play with this. And so I can say, you know, I can do very different kinds of sentences. I can say in Texas, they like to buy. And then things is the top uh, completion there. Um, but then beer comes next and horses and coffee and cattle and so forth. Okay, if I keep scrolling down, in New York, they like to buy, so same sentence, uh, things also, New York uh, people like to buy things as well, uh, and then clothes and then books and then stuff or shoes or coffee or food. Now, these lists are long. These least lists of completions are long. What if I could visualize all of this? So that's the next step. We're visualizing all of these completions at once here, okay? And uh, my Texas sentence is in green here in Texas, they like to buy. My New York sentence is in orange in New York, they like to buy. And I have my axes. In fact, I'm going to turn these axes axes horizontally. And what's happening here is the more to the top of my visualization a word is, the higher the likelihood in Texas, okay? The more to the bottom, the higher the likelihood in New York. So in Texas, cattle is the top. Uh, and, and I'm also trying to differentiate one from the other. So the highest and more different things in Texas is cattle and the highest and most different thing in New York is art. So art, books, clothes, cattle, uh, land, beer, horses, cotton, and so forth. We can also, you know, uh, put here, let's, let's uh, start putting Massachusetts. Let's look at what Massachusetts folks like to buy. We like to buy tea and books and paper and newspapers, okay? So we can play with this. Again, this is public, you can, you can play with this. Um, because we are at Harvard, uh, let's start saying something like at Harvard, no, let me do, let me do Harvard, oops, is great at, and then Yale is great at. Okay, let's see it uploading. Okay, so Harvard is great at business, diplomacy, investing. Yale is great at poetry and composition and arts and sports and teaching. And so, Really interesting set of results there. And you can play with this at your heart's content. Um, if we look at names, names are really interesting. So, um, and again, I'm going to turn my axes uh, horizontally. So I have Lauren was born in the year of, and these are the top choices here, 1993 and 1994. And Elsie was born in the year of 
1770, 1860, and so forth. So you can really start to see the different statistics around names. In fact, I'm going to now put my own name there. Fernanda was born in the year of, and Ido, who is my host, was born in the year of, let's, let's hope, Ido, you don't mind. I'm going to update this visualization here. And okay, what have we gotten? Uh, Fernanda was born in the year of 1946 or uh, 1962. Ido was born 1100, 1700, 1600. So I'm thinking, Ido, your name comes probably from kings um, or biblical name, but it's really interesting. But in the end, I think I'm younger than you. So. We can come back to that during our conversation. Um, finally, Jane. Jane worked, again, thinking about names. Jane worked as a versus Jim worked as a. Jane worked as a waitress, as a nurse, as a secretary, uh, as a model. And Jim works worked as a mechanic, a carpenter, a salesman, uh, a waiter, a musician. And so why does that matter? Why do these things matter? They matter because obviously we're starting to see a lot of stereotypes here, right? Um, and remember this model was uh, trained on all of Wikipedia and a huge number of books from the Brown collection. So these are not things that this model is inventing. These are correlations that actually exist in the data. But I think one of the things that's super interesting is that the model makes it so crisp and so clear how many biases there are um, in, 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 in the articles we read, in the books we read. Uh, and so that's uh, quite, quite interesting. Um, the new doctor was named versus the new nurse was named. And so I'm going to go back to our little trick here. The new doctor was named Mr. Himself, Dr. David Michael. The new nurse was named Sarah, Catherine, C Catherine, Margaret, Ellen, and so forth. Again, we're seeing those stereotypes play themselves over and over again. I'm going to stop here and go back to my slides because one of the things that I think we should think about is what are these models good for? Uh, it turns out these language models are incredibly powerful. Um, and so, you know, word correlations are fine if what you want to do is understand and describe the world around us. Um, but they may not be fine if we want to use these models to then point at future decisions about people, right? Think about everything I just showed you, and then think about if I were to use a model like this to decide who gets a loan, who should be hired, who should be admitted to college, I might be uh, playing back all of these biases um, that uh, were found in this model in, the, in this data set. So I think we need to be very careful, um, not only about spotting biases, but also understanding that the data sets that exist, they exist for a reason and they exist in a certain context. And we need to understand are the contexts in which we're using these models and data sets the same or are they very different? And how do we bridge these, these uh, differences? And so in summary, what I want to say is a couple, I wanna leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is that even though this is an extremely powerful technology, we should not be expecting miracles here. Um, let's not think that these machines learn on their own and then we're done. Like it does take a village to build an AI system, a good one at least. Um, and this quote comes from my colleague, Greg Corrado um, at Google. Human beings are involved in the entire pipeline of this thing, right? From collecting data, labeling data, training the model, tweaking the model, monitoring, hopefully once these models are deployed, there is monitoring, there is maintenance. Uh, because if you stop doing this today, a couple of days from now, these models stop working. They're they not good anymore. And so you need to be careful about that. 
do the data work, not only the model work. This is one of the things we see a lot is that the sexy thing to do is to work on your model, on your algorithm. But the truth is that everything comes from the data, everything these models learn. And yet data work somehow is not that sexy. We need better tools to look at massive data sets. Um, and we need to um, equip people to be able to be critical about these data sets. Invest on controllability, user controllability, and interpretability, explainability. We can learn from these systems and we should be controlling them. They shouldn't control us, we should be controlling them. Um, and finally, work with a broad range of stakeholders and impacted users, right? If this is something that is going to impact communities, you have to take their uh, perspective into account. This is incredibly important uh, to be including uh, their perspective in the development, not only afterwards, but in the development um, of your technology. And with that, I would love to invite uh, Professor Berger back. Um, thank you very much, um, Fernanda, for, for a very stimulating presentation. And for the next um, 10 minutes or so, I would like to delve into some of the areas you touched on um, and to raise some additional questions, and then we will sure. follow uh, with um, questions from the audience, which are coming in um, as we speak. Um, so, given given your broad expertise and the broad range um, that you took in this in this presentation, I would like to explore questions that are related both to the science and deployment of AI, and also to the kind of the policy oriented or the decision making um, issues. So um, to start, I just want to um, shift gears a little bit. I would like to ask you what particular recent or, or something that's upcoming uh, development in AI excites you the most and, and for what reason? So I think one of the things that has been very impressive to me um, in the last couple of years is the, um, the how much large language models, um, how much they can do. Um, and one of the reasons why I think this is so exciting is that for the first time, I think we can start to think about language as a user interface. So I know we have dialogue systems and we talk with Alexa and other, other you know, uh, systems and it's, and it's fine. But imagine, I think for the first time we can start imagining if, for instance, to um, program computers, what if you can talk to them? What if you can just tell the computer what you want and you actually don't need to go through the trouble of kind of speaking computer language? You can speak natural language. Um, what are all the other things we can do um, just using language as a tool? And that has not really been available before. Um, and so I'm very excited about this area. I, I should also say there, as, as I hope it became clear in the demo I gave, language has all sorts of challenges, all sorts of challenges, because it's super cultural. And so even though it's, it's this super promising horizon, it's also incredibly challenging. Yeah. Um, so I think related to, to this, um, you, you made a point that, um, you know, these algorithms don't learn on their own. They need supervision from humans, uh, both to kind of, um, you know, in terms of the data input and to make sure that we understand what, what actually happens on the other end. Um, but, but do you see the possibility where, you know, AI algorithms will teach other AI algorithms and kind of take the humans out of the loop? And if, if that's possible, um, you know, can we teach ethics or or something like that? Can we can we teach them to think more like humans? Do you, do you see that as a possibility? That's interesting. I I think that there are mul multiple answers to that question. I think um, on the question specifically, technically speaking, can these algorithms start teaching other algorithms? I do think we're starting to see um, a little bit of that with things like AutoML where um, these are systems that are automatically trying to build systems um, <clears throat> to, um, to, to solve problems. So one of the things that, uh, you know, is, is really interesting and really core to machine learning is the fact that, as I said, instead of writing all the rules, what you write is a goal, 
right? You write the goal, the objective function, and then the system tries to optimize for that. And so there are systems already that are starting to do that. Do I think, do I think they're going to take humans out of the loop? One, I don't think, I don't see this happening anytime soon just because there's so many problems still and, and things break and things go the wrong way. So one, technically speaking, I don't see something that happens completely automatically with no human whatsoever. Two, I don't think we want that. Uh, for many reasons, I, I think we want to be able to, even though, um, and, and this is uh, something that uh, Professor Ben Schneiderman an H HCI professor, this is like that, this has been his mantra for the last couple of years is even though we want systems that can be maybe highly automated, we also want high user control for these systems that are highly automated. You can think about something like a really powerful digital camera. All sorts of things are happening there that are highly automated, thankfully. But I also have a lot of control over what picture I take and how it looks and what I want to edit and things like that. So I think this is, I really like that way of thinking because it doesn't mean that it's like a dichotomy. It's like either the machine controls everything or the human has to control everything. It's like, we can do this together. We can all have more, you know, uh, either more, automa more automation and more control. But again, these things need to be designed. They're not going to come for free. The controllability, explainability, all of these things need to be designed into this, these systems, and they take time, and they take effort. Uh, but I do think that that is exactly the path uh, we want to take. No, thank you. Um, so um, switching gears a little bit, um, as someone who works both in the development and deployment of AI, um, what do you see as the most productive paths and also the potential pitfalls for the interaction between people that work on fundamental AI research and development, and then domain specific implementations and needs. Um, how do we foster this productive interaction between developers of AI algorithms and then the users that might employ them in very different contexts? Yeah, I, uh, I think for now, as much as possible, if we can have the engineers and researchers working together, the better these systems are going to be. So we're still, for, for a lot, I should say, for a lot of applications, we're still in, in a context where these things are very tailored and they have to be tailored because this is just the beginning. We're just learning how this technology can be applied to different domains. And so it's extremely important that we work with the domain experts and that they help inform the technology. Absolutely. So for instance, the the example I showed with the diabetic retinopathy, that was only possible because um, uh, the Google team had access to doctors and to hospitals. There is no absolute, there is no question that this would never happen if domain experts weren't involved, right? I also think that by, with this interact, interaction between domain experts and technologists, you can start to build a set of standards and a set, a set of uh, best practices that are really important for this technology to move forward. So we already know, for instance, that um, I talked a little bit about trust issues. Domain experts like doctors have a really hard time trusting these technologies and for good reason, right? So by working with them, we understood that some of the questions they have in their mind, even before they use an AI system is like, how was it trained? What edge cases did it see? Who are the people who labeled this data? Um, what is the data set that, and because they want to understand what are the strengths and the weaknesses of these systems. And the really good news, so, so we should be doing that, not only for medicine, we should be doing that for different domains. Um, and the important thing here, I think it's, it's to highlight the fact that it's not like doctors are necessarily expecting a, a perfect uh, system. It's the fact that doctors, once they realize where the weaknesses and the strengths are, they can work with that. They can work with that bias. And as long as they are informed and they have transparency, then they can work with that. And so I think this is exactly the kind of learning that we are doing together. 
is what are the pieces that are super important for the domain experts? How can we build tools that speak their language? That's another thing that's very important. A lot of interpretability techniques today are too close to the models and to the, in, and to the inner workings of these systems. We need, to, we need to start branching out from that and speaking the language of the users, healthcare, musicians, architects, different, different domain expertise are going to call for different kinds of explainability. Excellent. Um, so now um, one, one kind of final question um, around um, more about policy issues. So um, artificial intelligence, like human intelligence, can be used for both beneficial and, and in both beneficial and destructive ways. And I think we're going to start touching on this and we will hear later today about uh, questions of ethics and regulations. Uh, but I'm wondering what kind of safeguards, if any, can AI researchers and algorithm developers themselves um, specifically develop to ensure or at least encourage the ethical use and ethical outcomes of AI? I'm a big fan of documentation. And I'll tell you what kind of documentation I mean. <clears throat> I, I think that, for instance, uh, so one of the things that happens today in, in AI is that data is hard to come by. And so what happens is once someone has a data set that turns out to be very useful for different kinds of models, say image classification or video understanding or language, um, they may open source that data set. And that's great because other people can reuse that data set. Doesn't mean that everybody has to start from, from scratch. That's great. One of the pitfalls of that is that there's almost no documentation around these data sets. And so I don't know exactly why this data set was created. What was the, the goal for this data set? I many times don't have a sense of the distribution within this data set. As I was saying, one of the things that we lack today are good tools to look at and inspect huge, massive data sets. And so it's hard. If I'm going to reuse an open source data set, how do I know what's in there? And so um, one of the things that I think is key is, is for all of us, industry, academia, to start documenting the data sets we open source. This is the reason why this data set was created. This is what it contains. These are its limitations. These are some of the things you may want to use it for. These are the things you don't want to use it for. And so I think, um, and that can be something that, you know, um, I think governments should, should be uh, um, incentivizing. Um, that is also true of documenting models. So why was this model built? What was it trained on? And then you go back to the data set and then you get documentation from the data set. But again, like what are, what are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? What are uses you may not consider for this, uh, for this kind of model? And so I feel like we all need to communicate better um, so that we can make much better informed decisions um, as we use this technology. Thank you, um, Fernando, for these, these thoughts. We have um, time now and we'll switch over to questions from, from the audience. And there are Quite a few questions, so I'm going to pick and choose a few that uh, seem to come up um, several times. Uh, so one question is regarding the um, how large of a data set, um, or how do you know how much data you need in order to train an algorithm to do something? Ah, that is a great question, and it, there is no good answer for that. Um, in the sense, one of the things you want to do is you want to test. Um, so one, if you have access to tools that allow you to look and peek into your data set, please use them. Um, one of the things we do in my team at Google, it's called Pair. Um, we create these tools that allow you to investigate data sets, massive amounts of, of data sets. So please take a look at the Pair Google website. Um, so as much as you can inspect your data set, but not on, don't stop there inspect how your data set does for different slices of your either if it's a population or who is going to be using what are the different uh, different uh, use cases of the of this system you're building and so 
testing everything, testing different slices is, is incredibly, incredibly important. Another thing I'll say in terms of research, so this doesn't help people who are deploying systems right now, but hopefully it will help soon. And I mean, some of it is already in, in production, is that there is ongoing active research on small data sets. So the whole point, one of the, one of the hopes with a lot of this is that now you have large models that have been trained on tons of data, say all of the internet or all of the English language. And now you can retrain these data, these models, which with much smaller, much more specific data sets for your use case, right? And so that's really powerful because it doesn't mean that you need massive amounts of data, access to massive amounts of data anymore. You can just use much better data that you know about, maybe that you've collected, um, hopefully it's high quality, to retrain these systems. But again, I always go back to, you have to test. You have to test, and once you deploy systems, you have to have an open channel of feedback. Uh, because I can guarantee you, no matter how much you test, uh, there will be edge cases you never thought about. Um, and so it's absolutely important. Thank you. Um, another um, set of questions has come in um, related to something that's on um, a lot of people's mind, COVID, um, and the question of whether um, AI has been used in uh, COVID research or in any COVID-related um, activity that, that you're aware of. Yes, it has, and in different ways. So um, one is in the development of new drugs, but an, a, another way that it has been used that I think is super interesting is um, one, of the, one of the phenomena that happened when COVID started and the entire world was rushing to try to better understand the virus is just the sheer amount of publications, scientific publications that were coming out. And so nobody could keep up with that. So what happens is that uh, there are now, um, I know that Google's put it out, but it, Google is not the only one. There are libraries for NLP, for natural language processing, where they have looked at this huge and growing corpus of scientific knowledge and make it very simple um, for scientists and doctors to look for things and to look for summary of things. And so, you know, give me everything you have on children ages five to 11 and COVID. Give me everything you have with immunocompromised uh, folks. And, and, and so you can do all sorts of queries uh, very quickly. And I thought that was a really interesting um, um, use of the technology. Um, we also have questions about um, self-driving cars, um, which is, I think, another uh, very interesting application of AI and one where um, we're starting to see the interaction of human and, and AI-driven machines uh, in the same space. Um, and so um, I'm wondering if, if you can give us some views on, on where you see this is heading. Do you, do you think that we will eventually shift to completely um, you know, AI-driven um, cars? That, uh, that's a million dollar question or even way more than a million dollar question. Um, I don't know. I do think there, there, that it's been very interesting to see just how much automation has already been, is already happening, right? Um, but I'll tell you an anecdote that I think is, is quite telling and um, of, of what the future holds. So, um, when uh, our team at Google was starting this center called PEAR, People Plus AI Research, um, where we were emphasizing the importance of human-centered AI, um, we were talking with a number of leads um, at Google, and we talked with uh, one of the, the, with the research lead for a driverless car for robotics. And uh, to my surprise, one of the things he said uh, was, oh yes, this is incredibly important. Um, in fact, I'd say this is the most important set of problems we have in driverless cars because the technology of sensing, the sensing technology, um, we are well on track for, you know, we're gonna solve a lot of these problems, but the problems with, or the challenges with the human AI interaction, the pedestrian and the car, 
the cars and other cars with non-drive, like it, how are we, these are going to take um, longer, um, he felt. And so he was one super eager to embrace this notion of how do we design with the users? How do we think not only about the cars themselves, obviously, but, and also when you think about, we were talking about explainability, one of the questions is how much explainability should a, should a self-driving car do as it's driving? Do we want the car to say everything it's doing? Of course not. But we want some status of the car. Uh, so even understanding how much the car should update you or not, in what situations it should update you, um, is, is ongoing research. Um, so I think that this question of, um, humans and cars, not only the cars and cars themselves, I, I think those are going to be really interesting. Yeah, that is that is very interesting, getting getting constant feedback from the car about changing lanes and, and making this decision or that decision. Um, so we have time for one final question. Um, and this question is related to, um, again, partly related to the question of, of ethics. Um, and so do you think there should be, or, or are there already um, red lines in terms of the AI technology development or implementation or deployment uh, that we should agree on as a society, as a species that we're not going to cross? That is a good question. I don't know that there are, I, I don't know that there is complete consensus yet, but I do think that there is an incredibly healthy debate going on. And I do think that we need red, line, uh, red lines. Um, I think that governments around the world are um, debating that question and are trying to figure out what are the red lines. They, at, you know, they, they are they see the potential for the technology and they don't want to curb it. But at the same time, they see that there are contexts and there are high stakes situations where you we're not ready. We don't know enough. To, uh, to know how to use uh, the technology. I do think in those situations, and, I was, and this was part of my provocation during my, my presentation today, in, in some of these situations, it, to me, it's not that we shouldn't use at all, we should completely bar the technology, but I do think the technology at most should be just one opinion in the middle of many opinions that are, you know, that are, human opinions that are domain experts opinions that um, I, I do see a benefit of having some flavor of this technology around as an assistive technology. But I really don't think we're ready for automation in, you know, when, when, when you talk about things like admissions, when you talk about loans, when you talk about uh, bail, when you talk, there are a number of very complex situations where uh, these are situations that we as a society have never had to, to be super crisp mm -hmm. about. And, and this technology now is forcing us to articulate some of our values around these things. And so to me, that is the part that is the most challenging, but also in a sense, the most interesting, because we're going to have to scratch our heads and come together and decide what is it that we think is, is the right way forward? What are the values we uphold? Um, and, and then we can worry about how we, you know, turn those values into math. But the debate really is one about values. Well, thank you um, so much, Professor Villegas. I think this is this is an excellent note to um, to end uh, this session on. Thank you for your presentation and for answering um, our questions. Um, so this concludes our first session. Uh, we will now take a short break. Thank you. <laughs>